that this work with Daphne last year. So, this was acute spinal injury. How about chronic? Can we you know, uh, break down scar tissue with that? But we were really uh, uh, intrigued by the robust decrease in all these molecules. We got up to 90% suppression of some of these molecules, these inhibitors in the scar. So we thought maybe we're not just suppressing the, the ability of the intraspinal to make these uh, molecules. Maybe we're also promoting their degradation. We're breaking down some of these scar associated inhibitors. And one molecule that we know has the ability to break down scar tissue, which once again is naturally made by the body, so that is an enzyme called plasmid. Now, plasmid is a really powerful molecule. It'll cut up proteins everywhere. There's a serine, that amino acid. So basically, it's a very powerful molecule. And it's very tightly regulated by the body and how it's used. If you just injected plasmid into the spinal cord, you'd make a hole. You know, you'll be very careful how you use it. But we were interested, in, once again, though, whether Deprin was inducing plasmid. And we saw a 17 fold increase in this molecule in Deprin treated injured spinal cord. And I'm not going to show you data here because there wasn't enough time to, to, to tell you. But I'll quickly mention that it was associated with the membranes of, of cells. And so in that way, we know it's been properly controlled. It won't necessarily just make a hole. It's used by the cell to remodel the scar tissue around it. So the last part of the talk, I'm going to talk about ways of bridging the injury site, which is the right cell type. Many different cell types have been tried. I've got a list here of cells that are not from the central nervous system. Schwann cells or fibroblast engineered to release both factors, or in fact, in shielding cells. I'm sure a lot of you already know about this. And, and there's been varying degrees of success with, with, with these cell types. Cells of uh, central nervous system origin. Immature astrocytes from the cerebral cortex have been tried. Not much success. I'll touch on why in a second. Why and why. Neural stem cells have been tried. Build recovery, not much going on. Glial progenitors. I'll explain you know, the relationship between neural stem cells and little progenitors in a second, but they've been tried without much success. Let me say you'll see why in a second. So, we pursued the idea that you know, our experiments have shown that the astrocytes away from a spinal cord injury seem to be the cell type that's good for supporting axon growth. So, maybe the astrocytes we're seeing here are different from the astrocytes in the scar. Very little is known about different types of astrocytes in the nervous system. They've been neglected. Very common cell type. Uh, and, and a very important cell type. So maybe these, these, these astrocytes here are different from the ones in the scar. So we raised the idea, can you make the right kind of astrocyte for repairing the, the spinal cord injury? So we turned our attention to glial-restricted precursors. And uh, we did this work with Margot Mark Rochelle and Mark Noble up at York, uh, Rochester University. And in general terms, embryonic stem cells give rise to neural stem cells. The neural stem cells can make neuron-restricted precursors. So the idea is we have a lineage here where the cells from, from your embryonic stem cell are becoming more and more restricted in terms of what types of cells they can make. The embryonic stem cell can make all kinds of tissue, as far as we know. Whereas a neural stem cell can only make neural cells. And now it's restricted again to these precursors that just make neurons. Or in this instance, a glial-restricted precursor can just make those support cells I mentioned, the astrocytes, not the dendrocytes. Now, glial-restricted precursors can make oligodendrocytes. We heard about those, uh, I think, last year from Hans Kirsted. The idea being you can use these cells to remyelinate uh, uh, axons that, that may have survived an injury and uh, promote recovery that way. But of course, you do have the possibility that there may still be inhibitors associated with those cells. But we also, well, we wanted to pursue the idea of making different types of astrocyte. And so little is known about different types of astrocyte. At the moment, we're, we're stuck with this idea of either maybe type 1s or type 2s, which you need to come up with some more fancy names for them. And the problem is, as well, that lots of people have got their type 1 astrocyte and, 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 and you know, think it's better than everybody else's. Well, we're making our type 1 astrocyte from embryonic glial restricted precursors, and that's an important difference if you go start looking at papers and look at type 1 astrocytes. Ours is made in a, specific, in a specific way. And what's really interesting is the type 1 astrocytes that we're making have low levels of inhibitors, high levels of growth factors, and highly supportive axon growth. We can also make type 2 astrocytes. They look different, and also they have different effects on axon growth. High levels of inhibitors, low in growth factors, poorly supportive of axon growth. Now the question is, can an adult stem cell be used to make a glial restricted precursor that can make a type 1 astrocyte, because obviously it's the cell we're interested in, or will it make type 2s? Now, 
I'll show you a comparison in a minute of what happens with type 1s and type 2s. That's un unpublished data that are presented today. So, we're interested in type 1s. And we transport them into our injury model I showed you. And look to see whether they could suppress scar formation and could they promote axon growth across the injury site. And we're also going to look at whether they promote recovery or behavioral recovery. So, the first thing we looked at was the effects on scar formation. This is an untreated injury, we're looking at the injury margin, and you can see the astrocytes here are walling off that injury site, as I've shown you before. But in this, uh, uh, the other panel here, we've transplanted in our type 1 GDAs, that's glial restricted precursor derived astrocytes, a bit of a mouthful, but GDA cells, type 1s, put them in, and they migrate into the injury margin. And what we find is that by eight days, they realign the host astrocytes, they're realigning the tissue. It's a remarkable effect. We just transplanted these cells. No scaffolds put in, we just put in cells, and they realign compared to an untreated injury which is walling off the injury site. Is that these astrocytes are, are changing the, the structure of the injury site. So we developed a whole new method for quantifying this change. So we looked at the angle between the astrocyte, the adult astrocyte processes in the, in the injury margin and measured them and found that there was an average angle of only 11 degrees between the processes. They're almost parallel. In, with the GDA treated uh, injuries versus almost a, an average angle of 60 degrees in untreated, this really misaligned tissue. So, what happened to the axons? We put in the traces. You are aware of, of this kind of technology. The idea is that we can visualize axons. And these axons, we're looking at heavy green axons, they're not from a transplant of, of neurons. These are endogenous, these are uh, uh, sensory axons in the spinal cord, in adenine neurons. And we look at their ability to cross an injury site that's been bridged with GDA cells, type 1 GDA cells. So the, the GDA is now in red, the axon is in green. We have our bridging transplant here. This is one 20 micron thin section, very thin section. Look at the number of axons that we're getting across. The robust axon growth, they're going into the injury site and they're coming out the far side. And why are you seeing little bits of axon here uh, uh, on either side? It's because there's a little bit of distortion of the injury site. And we wanted to show, uh, so the axons are going in and out the plane of the section. We wanted to show the axons in the, in the center of the injury to really show the axons right in the middle of the injury site that's bridged with the type 1 astrocytes. So we started quantifying. 100% of the axons prior to the injury, 66% of them make it to the injury center by eight days. 40% have made it out the far side and continue growing up the spinal cord. This is a really robust regenerative response. But all we did was put in with the right kind of embryonic astrocyte. No added growth factors, no other treatments. Hopefully, we'll see even greater efficiency when we start adding these cells with other treatments, other labs have developed, or death. So, we had another model. There's a problem with sparing. You, have, you think you're looking at regenerative.